going to get started again. I have the honor of uh, moderating the final session. Um, we have just such a rich study and such rich case uh, studies in this, in this uh, program. And we are very honored uh, today to have uh, uh, three very distinguished case authors. And then uh, Ken is going to be our uh, US uh, discussant. So um, I'm going to uh, introduce the panel. Uh, each member of the panel will give a short presentation um, on the uh, political and <coughs> some of the uh, variables uh, coming emanating from uh, their part of the world. And, uh, and then hopefully we'll have some discussion and open up to the audience for questions. So uh, we're going to start with Luay Al-Khatib, who is the executive director and founder of the Iraq Energy Institute and a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution. And then uh, Isidro Morales, who is a professor at Monterey Institute of Technology and Higher Education. Uh, Isidro is a uh, long-term uh, collaborator with the Baker Institute in our previous study on uh, Mexico, which I'm pleased to say uh, hopefully added some insights in the positive uh, path of reform in Mexico. And, uh, and then uh, my good friend Steve Lewis, who is the C. V. Star Transnational China Fellow uh, here at the Baker Institute. Um, so I uh, thank the panel. I'm not going to do biographies because we're tight for time to end on time. People have uh, planes to catch, so we're going to try to stay very on schedule. And I'd like to ask uh, Luay to get us uh, started. Cedro's presentation. Oh. Oh, that's my presentation, but yeah. uh, yes. Um, uh, it up in the order of the program. Right. Let me go take should care we, of that. Should we, should I go? we can change the order. Oh, there they are. OK. Well, thank you very much, Amy, for the uh, introduction. Uh, I would like to thank the James Baker Institute and uh, Harvard University for inviting me to play part in this uh, this study and uh, to inviting me to, to the uh, conference. Um, it's a great honor for me to, to be here in Houston and, uh, and um, uh, thank you very much. I'm, I just want to check the... Taking care of that. Hold is it? It's well, uh, when it comes to Iraq, I, uh, I would like to say that at Houston we have a problem. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the problem is not very much about the gas issue, but uh, I'm trying to explain Iraq in 10 minutes. Do you have a, on a stick uh, presentation? What happened to this presentation? Huh? Uh, oh. Well, I sent it by email, but you can have it. And uh, let's hope I get extra minute. <laughs> uh, but uh, we'll, we'll start talking about, about basically uh, um, the the case in general, the case is very much in um, in, in details around 50 pages, and and, and I do advise uh, everyone to uh, interested in, in Iraq to really visit the case and, and download it and, and and at least read the the scenarios. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry. When it comes to uh, Iraq gas, uh, the Iraqi gas, uh, it's unfortunately the, the least uh, uh, utilized commodity. It uh, kind of like um, uh, lacked the attention for the last uh, 30, 34 years uh, since the Iraq-Iran war followed by the um, invasion of Kuwait and the 12-year the sanction, then the, the regime change in 2003 onwards. Uh, this uh, has caused uh, a lot of um, uh, problem and overcomplicating uh, the, the progress of developing this vital sector of which could, be, could have been used as an economic multiplier in, 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 in uh, diversifying Iraq's economy. The uh, biggest challenge in the uh, Iraq 
uh, in the Iraqi gas is because it's mostly in associated form. Around 80-81% of it in associated form. It's uh, uh, mostly uh, situated in the southern part of Iraq. And um, although it presents an opportunity, uh, but because of the uh, uh, challenging uh, institutional setting in Iraq, uh, previously in uh, very much central system moving to federal that's yet to be uh, evolving into more federal institution. Then um, in addition to that, uh, considering the um, investment option, all these things need to be in place to really make maximum use of this uh, important commodity. Um, the, um, uh, the reserves um, in Iraq, um, although it's stated by the Ministry of Oil at 126 trillion cubic feet, uh, uh, with um, another estimate pre presented by uh, the Kurdistan regional government as a hundred TCF, uh, yet to be appraised and, and, and confirmed as proven reserves, still all these numbers could be uh, very much uh, uh, underestimated uh, given the fact that Iraq uh, oil and gas sector in, as in general is underexplored uh, under and uh, gas specific is underexplored. Uh, um, uh, uh, and um, w when it comes to the utilization and, and the development, it requires significant uh, foreign investment uh, that could reach to uh, 250 billion US dollars, of which uh, federal budget uh, may not be uh, sufficient to finance any of these projects. And that's why the role of IOCs is uh, vital in developing and speeding up the progress of, of this sector. The current production at the moment is around 2 uh, BCF, uh, of which at least 55% of it is unfortunately flared. And uh, in the, the main key players in the gas sector now, and from the um, foreign um, oil companies um, um, community, I would say, uh, the, uh, in the south, the Basra Gas Company, uh, led by the Shell Mitsubishi Consortia and joint venture with the South Gas Company uh, to handle the South Gas opportunity uh, with focusing on associated gas of the main fields of uh, Romaila, West Gurnawan, and uh, Zubair. And in the north, we have the uh, Pearl Consortium, and that's the um, uh, um, uh, uh, the Danagas, Crescent Petroleum, OMV, and Mall. And uh, between them, uh, the moment in the north, uh, we, the, the utilized gas is around 350 million standard cubic feet, mostly feeding into uh, the power sector. But uh, this is mostly from the Hormor field. Uh, and um, if, of course, if the Chemchemal uh, field uh, developed, uh, it could offer a potential capacity that could, uh, if it's uh, maximized, uh, optimized, basically, uh, to to the uh, to the maximum level, it could uh, offer um, export capacity. The in the south, um, the uh, associated gas is very much linked to the oil production, and. Uh, any surplus capacity, uh, it has to be considered carefully because the local consumption uh, across the country uh, is increasing uh, by, the, by the day. If we take a quick look into the um, associated uh, gas um, uh, production here, you could see it's uh, increasing above uh, Hundred and um, that's a, a, around uh, 1.2 uh, BC, around 1.2 BCF just on the flaring uh, as a flaring capacity, uh, but as I said, uh, as oil production increases, um, associated gas volume could increase significantly, and that's why the development of the uh, South Gas. Um, um, joint venture and projects uh, should uh, move uh, very fast, as well as other potential development in uh, other fields which, um, in the south could, should be considered uh, to achieve the target set by the government, which is the zero flaring. 
uh, target. Of course, that target uh, is going to be rather challenging, was first put as like in 2015. Uh, I don't know uh, how realistic that uh, date, but we are only 10 months from uh, that deadline, and we are still flaring about uh, close to 1.2 uh, BCF. The amount of investment uh, required for the uh, energy sector it depends on what scenario that we would take, whether it's a low case, mid case, or high case, but definitely it's uh, within the range of 500 to uh, 750 billion US dollars, and uh, this requires, of which at least 50% of it goes to the uh, uh, upstream uh, development. The um, current and future capacities of consumption, um, it's moving towards switching from liquid in terms of like crude, burning crudes, uh, heavy fuel oil, and um, um, diesel into um, gas. And this could eventually lead into consume, uh, directing at least uh, 99 to 95 percent of the uh, gas uh, fuel to feed power sector. Uh, if we take the, um, the scenarios that we put uh, between 2015 to, to 2030 and on incremental oil production from 4.5 million barrels to 7 and then to 10, uh, there will be a margin of spare capacity that could be available for export, but only for temporarily uh, um, uh, period bet uh, between eight to ten years maximum, and this could uh, um, build up to uh, around between eight to um, eleven BCM per annum. With regards, uh, but after to the, by 2030. Um, Based on existing number, Iraq will need further uh, gas uh, to feed uh, the, the power national grid and industry, unless, of course, compensated by uh, exports, uh, sorry, exploration uh, capabilities and, and, and exploration efforts uh, as Iraq progress on the uh, exploration effort. The, um, according to the Iraq national energy uh, strategy, um, Oil production, it depends on what scenario that we, we would take from oil production, whether it's from the 6 million barrels to, eight, uh, to the 9 million barrels or up to the 12 million barrels. Um, the, the, uh, the gas uh, ratio to oil, it could move between um, the 4 BCM to uh, 8 BCM. Uh, sorry, yeah, from uh, 8 BCF to uh, from 4 BCF to 8 BCF per day, and this eventually will provide enough uh, supply to the to the local consumption. Uh, the problem is that uh, if Iraq will uh, have all the infrastructure ready to consume uh, all that supply, if uh, Iraq uh, continue to suffer lack of infrastructure, then this gas need to be uh, monetized through um, export, otherwise it will be flared. This is another uh, slide showing the, um, the uh, basically the level uh, of um, uh, oil to gas, uh, the gas to, uh, the gas to oil ratio, and uh, and the um, from fetched from the uh, licensing round one, two, and three. Uh, just a concluding remark uh, on Iraq. Uh, depends on uh, the, the level of challenges that we're trying to assess, whether it's constitutional, institutional, uh, policy reform, etc., versus, and then we take uh, the other challenges, which is the security, political. Uh, I came up with, with two scenarios, a united Iraq versus anarchic Iraq. And, uh, and depends on uh, what direction Iraq would take. Um, uh, the um, constitution and uh, political and security will define the, the, the new Iraq for, for good or worse. Uh, uh, the um, uh, Iraq gas potential remains heavily underexplored, and uh, the current projection is needed to feed uh, the growing local demand. Uh, power sector could increase up to, uh, the demand could increase up to 46 gigawatt of electricity by 2030, and this would require a significant amount of, of gas 
uh, otherwise Iraq will rely on burning uh, liquid fuel, which is quite costly. Uh, aggressive exploration, of course, is required in terms of looking for uh, free gas uh, assets uh, to uh, maximize gas production to compensate for uh, the consumption required for local demand, as well as uh, identifying opportunities uh, for, for uh, export, um, as Iraq sits in a region where surrounded by um, uh, countries of basically gas thirst thirsty if we take uh, from uh, North Turkey or even Kuwait, across, just across the border. Um, projected commercial volumes for export could emerge for limited window between 20, 2020 and 2030, but the Iraqi government should uh, take uh, careful measures um, when it comes to uh, uh, considering export as many countries uh, fell in the trap of subscri oversubscribing its, their gas for export, ending up in a scenario of uh, exporting gas while they are net importer. And, um, and uh, there are plenty uh, of countries around the region uh, of having that scenario. Um, I just wanted to highlight a point on, on, this, uh, on this one. Back in 2008, Iraq, uh, between 2008 and, and 10, Iraq uh, talked a lot about uh, gas export, and uh, the Iraqi government signed um, heads of agreements uh, where the floating LNG factored in that agreement uh, uh, in, a, in a prominent uh, way. The, uh, the Iraq also signed an agreement with the European Union at that time uh, to supply gas um, for export. But in 2011 onwards, Iraq started to consider <laughs> importing gas from Iran. And that's why the, the country ended up in signing uh, um, agreement with, with Tehran um, on to import about 850 standard cubic feet. And th this show, uh, demonstrate uh, the, the policy vacuum and uh, lack of vision when it comes to uh, gas utilization and investment. Um, just final two points about uh, possible export for surplus gas could only happen if the northern field, uh, sorry, northern free gas uh, and, and the southern associated gas uh, kind of like the investment in, in these assets are maximized. The uh, free gas assets are possible if, uh, if proper term and, and inviting term incentives offered to IOCs to invest in, in, in potential uh, gas exploration. Uh, Mid-case scenario is very much uh, possible on the condition of stable Iraq, or united Iraq, should I say. The low-case scenario uh, proposed in the Iraq national energy uh, strategy um, is possible, uh, but very challenging, uh, given uh, the current condition of anarchic Iraq. And with this uh, point, I conclude. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to Amy, Ken, and Megan for their kind invitation to participate in this uh, big project. I was really very happy to write the Mexican chapter. Um, let me tell you that uh, I had to deliver the Mexican chapter at the end of November, and that's, this is because, of course, I was pressed by Ken and Amy to, uh, to uh, put an end to the paper. And at that moment, the uh, so-called energy reform was already been discussed in Congress, but the problem is that it was stuck in a congressional gridlock because the discussion uh, was intertwined with the fiscal reform, with the educa education reform, with the electoral reform, so the Congress was a mess. And of course, uh, every party was uh, trying to use the energy reform in order to capitalize uh, their positions. So I, uh, I tried to gain some time you know, to uh, have the final outcome, but I couldn't. So, but it's still worth reading my paper, believe me, because um, it, it tells you uh, it tells you what happened, uh, the, the political context and the economic context of the reform. 
And at the same time, as I uh, highlighted in that paper, um, uh, the reform was going to be voted at the end of uh, last year, I was right, or during this uh, semester. Okay, having said that, um, what I wanted to um, present to you is uh, a, a, a scenario of a, a, a Mexican energy sector after the reform, of course. And um, um, first of all, um, the major consequence as you know, is the end of state oil monopolism. Uh, I think Mexico was the only country in the world that uh, whose uh, energy sector was still run by a single state monopoly, very closed, but it was also intertwined with nationalism, with state dirigism, um, uh, with different kind of ism that uh, made very difficult um, um, policy change in the country for 72 years. Uh, even though NAFTA attempted to open the sector, it was very difficult to really end the state oil monopoly. So um, I have to recognize that the monopoly regime was very successful to uh, provide um, a secure energy supply uh, during 1938 up to the Second World War and afterwards. The problem with the uh, monopoly regime uh, came when Mexico wanted to maximize the oil rents when uh, prices uh, were high. As, as, as you can see it here, that's why I'm comparing international prices with Mexico's um, export performance. It doesn't work here, but anyway. You see in the blue line, uh, Mexico's output uh, in the um, uh, yellow line in, um, uh, below, Exports. So you may see how uh, during the 80s Mexico was successful to increase um, oil output and uh, to regain export markets uh, in order to um, optimize the oil rent because of high oil prices. So, so it was uh, successful, but the opportunity cost was extremely high. I'm not going back to that. Remember that in the 80s, Mexico had a huge external debt, that our uh, rate of growth was nearly zero, and that all the investments that were made by Pemex, uh, some of them were lost, especially uh, in petrochemicals, and there was a huge scandal on corruption, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to back that. The problem came at present worse, when once again, the, under the monopoly regime, Mexico wanted to increase its production and consequently its exports because exports were declining as you saw it in the, last, uh, in the past image. Here I'm comparing um, the ratio of proved reserves with production, so it's uh, remaining years of production of both gas and oil, and in the left, uh, in the right side of the graph, I'm um, showing investments in um, current dollars. Oh, this is, um, okay, thank you. Here, so you have uh, the investments. So these are historical records in all Mexico's history, and you see the poor performance. Mex Mexico was, the oil monopoly was not able to increase reserves in both gas and oil, and of course we, uh, you know the story that we went into net imports of um, gasoline, of gas, 22% of our gas consumption is being imported, even though Mexico has the reserves, and so on and so forth. So I'm not uh, going uh, to remind you that, Tom. What's the core of the reform? The core of the reform for me is that there will be two kind of um, um, uh, um, uh, land entitlements in Mexico. One will be done to Pemex, which is called appointments, or let's say entitlements, uh, assignaciones in Spanish, according to the new uh, law. And this will be done to Pemex. This will be granted to Pemex in a, what's being called a round zero, which in principle, it must start at the end of March. And then all value chains are being opened, all, all value chains are being opened to private investors, be it national or international, um, under contracts. And there will be 
uh, three types of contracts, uh, or four type, rather. Um, uh, services contracts, which will be paid cash. There will be profit sharing contracts, sharing profits, production sharing contracts as well, and licenses. And licenses, according to the new uh, uh, juridical discourse, um, will allow uh, operators to own the production at the wellhead and to pay a royalty or a tax, which is still to be defined by secondary legislation. That's the core of the reform. Another point is that payments will become um, a state um, productive enterprise, whatever that means. To my meaning, it means that payments will end of being a um, rent collector because it's his role. It's not a firm, it's a rent collector. Uh, it's, it's transferring 60% um, of its income directly to the treasury. So now it will become a company. We have to know how in which terms. Um, uh, it must become efficient, competitive, and productive. That's the challenge. And, uh, and uh, last but not least, there is a, a creation of a Mexican fund, similar to the Norwegian fund, which, uh, if you read the legislation, is pretty complicated, but the most important thing is that for the first time, the first time in the country, the collection of the oil rate will be um, accountable. It will be transparent, because during the monopoly regime, it was not accountable, it was not transparent. Okay, so now, um, uh, here you have the potential of Mexico after the reform, and um, the key point is to understand what will be the new role for Pemex in a uh, post-monopoly regime. And here, because I don't have the time, I, see, I can see three areas of opportunity. First, for Pemex, in this so-called uh, round zero, Pemex will have, according to the law, uh, those areas in which the company has already invested and has and have, must prove now that it's competitive to maintain the investments or production. And here I'm showing you, uh, uh, in the past years, 70% from eight to 12, 70% of all investments of Pemex went into this area, which is shallow waters and the southeast. In terms of gas, the southeast, there is a, a giant field called Lakash. Pemex has proved already investments there and, uh, and research, but according to the uh, National Hydrocarbon Commissions, and the project was rejected by technicalities, but put a condition. PEMX can have this fail if and only if gas prices are not below $2.5 thousand cubic feet. So make your, your, your calculations and see whether PEMX will be possible if she, uh, she will have the, pos the capability to gain that fail. Okay, since I'm very short of time, and I can see Amy that uh, he, she's pushing me. Um, um, the first area of opportunity will be shallow waters for Pemex, perhaps Lakash. The second area of opportunity will be definitely shale gas for private firms already working where? Here, in Texas because um, Pemex has um, drilled nine uh, wells already in this area and proved that uh, the northern part of the um, Sabinas, um, at this region, is a continuity of, of the Eagle Ford area. But Pemex is, was interested before the reform on wet gas because of condensates, and shale oil, not in dry gas. 
So this is a huge opportunity. I think the only area will be an opportunity for medium-sized um, firms already working in this area or in North America. The third area of opportunity will be for big firms, and this is in deep war, where uh, off offshore deep war, where Pemex has no uh, the capabilities for exploiting according to the new terms of the law with efficiency, um, with productivity, those fields. So this is the scenario, and um, what uh, I'm going to finish with this, uh, with just two slides. The scenario for production is very optimistic for the current government. I'm showing here official scenarios of Pemex, the last ones, and just concentrate on gas because we're dealing with gas. Uh, if Investments remain the same. This is more or less uh, 20,000, 20 billion annual dollars. Uh, production will remain the same, which means that we increase imports. But if uh, investments are being increased in 50%, of course, for private firms, it will reach 10 uh, billion daily cubic feet. This doesn't make Mexico a great exporter of gas, no. Because 10 billion cubic feet is more or less the uh, demand behavior for the years to come. So we, we will still import, um, but it will be marginal import from the US, definitely. And thus, I agree with uh, Ken's projections. But if we go to the very optimistic scenario, Mexico could become a, a major gas export. But for me, it's very difficult. Why? Pemex will concentrate on oil because oil the rents are here and not here. Last but not least, and I promise I end, Amy, um, Mexico needs to invest strongly in infrastructure gas lines. We don't have gas lines. And we are importing even LNG, which is more expensive than coming from the US, because we don't have the infrastructure in order to um, supply these areas, which is highly industrialized. These are the new plant air, uh, gas lines. Uh, that uh, payments has already started. We, uh, there, there is a strong opportunity for private investors because it's already privatized since NAFTA in this area. But, and I agree with Ken, the problem is that we have uh, furious carters disputing this area. So we have to also make some advances in terms of security. Uh, you know that um, Mexico has changed the paradigm in terms of security. We, we don't, uh, we are, we're not playing any more support from the US under the Merida Initiative. Now Mexico has inaugurated a new approach in Michoacán in order to um, um, make some alliances with some um, um, private armies in the region in order to combat drug bars. We don't know whether it's going to uh, reduce uh, security, but we hope so. And this is a requirement in knowing that Mexico's uh, brilliant future uh, uh, will be possible. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll speak from here. Uh, first of all, just let me say thank you to Megan and uh, Amy and Ken. Uh, always a pleasure working with you, and especially since I learned so much as I did today during the previous presentations. And so after a long day of presentations, every one of which, as far as I can tell, mentioned the 800-pound gorilla in the room, uh, China, uh, it now falls to the sinologist to confirm that there is indeed a gorilla. And uh, I, I think rather than reiterate what I think are some of the, a lot of the statistics about uh, things related to oil indexing and, and the role of uh, Central Asia and, and pipeline as in LNG contracts, things like that, I thought maybe I would just focus on one of the, the bigger wild cards uh, that I think the previous presentation 
organizations haven't talked about and which I think I can uniquely talk about, and that would be relating to the growth of, of shale gas in China. And the big question, will shale gas develop as quickly as some people are hoping? Certainly the Chinese government, the central government, is very ambitious in thinking it can get to 6.5 BCM by the end of 2015, uh, the end of the 12th five-year plan, and maybe 60 to 100 BCM by the end of 2020. And it's been called into question, and so I thought I would talk a little bit about why uh, it seems to be going a lot slower than it is. And it has to do with just the general, the bread scope of enormous number of reforms that they have to try and push through at all levels of government and involving all actors, everything from companies to individuals to, uh, to the, the government agencies themselves, but also the fact that they're dealing with some unique political situations. And so I'll, talk, I'll end up by talking a little bit about political corruption and how I think that that will is creating a, a kind of a state of paralysis in China probably for the next couple of years for some of the key actors who are essential for pushing these reforms forward. So obviously there's gonna be some need for price reform. Some of the other people had mentioned this. There's now something uh, from the end of last year called the 383 plan, which is to reform city gate prices. They have some experimental regions in the south, Guangdong province and Guangxi province. And as usually happens with pilot projects, uh, once they succeed in one area, they begin to uh, be transferred over to other areas of China. And so my guess is this will take another year or two before that's been established, that they are successful, and then they'll be transferred over most likely to other regions in the south and the southeast that are analogous in the sense that they're mainly dependent upon LNG um, and, uh, and perhaps nuclear uh, and less on coal and less on piped gas uh, from Central Asia. Um, there also, there's a question of opening up pipelines uh, of, C of CNPC or Sinopec or allowing more local competitors. And the government has done that by declaring that shale gas is a non-oil, non-gas resource. And so as far as uh, it's, it doesn't fit the strategic interests of, of forbidding private investors. And so they've been encouraging private investors, including private investment groups from East China uh, and all over, to, to step up and to try to put more pressure, I would say, on the, on the national oil companies uh, to make very large investments, which are going to be necessary. The, um, uh, the other thing which is also happening is potentially is uh, the, uh, the potentially eliminating the, the indirect subsidy from coal that follows through the state uh, running the Ministry of Railways. Uh, the Ministry of Railways trans you know, transfers most of the coal in China. It's like 70% of what is shipped on the railways is coal. And the central government has been in every now and then keeps talking about that and keeps talking about that. That would be a major, major step. And they don't think they seem to be ready for it. But that's another thing which could also radically transform uh, the demand for shale gas in China. Finally would be uh, the question of royalties uh, or payments to local governments or other actors to step up their role. Um, China traditionally does not provide royalties to local governments, and so there's always that tension in any type of energy project between those who are disadvantaged by everything that's going on around them and uh, everything from the, the pollution to all, all these types of things to protests uh, to how do we compensate them for that. And the central government seems to have come up with a way to round that by they've created something called shale gas development zones where they can say that this area has a high potential for shale gas, let's call it a shale gas development zone, which allows us to, like the special economic zones, we can appoint leaders directly from Beijing who will be responsible for that and maybe we can forgive the taxes they have. Uh, for example, that they would normally pay to the higher levels of government that are, that are around them in the province or to the central government, and they can keep them at that local level. This might especially apply to ethnic minority zones. Um, and so the ethnic minority areas of Chongqing, where the initial development of shale gas is taking off, seem to be some of the main areas where this is going on. So there are special rights for ethnic minority development zones, and there might also be for other regions of China as well. Um, I would say that some of these ones, anything involving the central government's uh, pricing reform on the, on the central government side, but especially involving CNPC and Sinopec, and also the, the Sichuan government are likely to be slowing down for the next year or two, because now it's been confirmed that there is a corruption probe with uh, a man named Zhou Yongkang, uh, and Zhou Yongkang was a, he's now stepped down, uh, he was a member of the Politburo Standing Committee, um, and so the highest ranking person who's been technically in being investigated, he's under house arrest. And one of the reasons that this has very broad impact is that uh, he was, uh, he rose up through CNPC ranks uh, and then was switched over to the government and he eventually became the 
head of all the state security, minister of state security and, and all the security affairs uh, run by the Politburo. And, uh, and one of the reasons that he was chosen is because if you rise up the ranks of CNPC or Sinopec, that's just like the way you rise up the ranks within the Communist Party itself. That they transfer you over to different provinces. So everybody who gets to the Politburo serves in two or three different regions before they get to the top. Same thing with CNPC. So somebody who gets to that age and that position in CNPC is, can be poached and brought over. And, and the, the central government has done that. And Zhou Yun Kong was one of those people. Unfortunately, what they're now finding out is that, that the, the corruption that's being the charges against him means having to go back and unravel every single set of relations and his entire network. Uh, and that network is a particularly powerful because from 88 to 96, he was the party secretary for Sheng Li, uh, the second largest oil field in China. So now every single official uh, who served, uh, especially at the director level or higher, within the Sheng Li oil field, um, which was a main training ground for officials in CNPC and Sinopec, is now implicitly under investigation. And so if you look at the names of many of the people who are for CNPC or Sinopec signing these deals with foreign partners, um, these are people who served in Shengli oil field between 1988 and 1996. So they're probably waiting for their names to be cleared um, in some way. It's already brought down uh, the former head of CNPC and four vice presidents. Uh, and then we'll continue. I also want to point out the other shoe that's waiting to drop is that he was the party secretary for Sichuan province for several years as well. And Sichuan province is where most of the shale gas is. I would say that this will, it would delay the things related to anything involving CNPC and Sinopec because those offices for those companies and Sichuan government are going to be dealing with Central Discipline Inspection Commission investigation teams for several years now. Typically these last for several years. The best measure might be the one for Bo Xilai, uh, the former one who was just convicted and the offices in Dalian and every locality where he served in were kind of shut down for several years because everybody's pulling out all the books and answering all the questions and to find out where, where is the corruption and how extensive is it. Uh, so this is something that's critically necessary for, the, uh, for, for Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang to do because uh, this is a potential threat uh, within the party, a, a high level faction. The, you know, on par with potentially the petroleum factions of the 1970s in influence, and they have to deal with it uh, very, very thoroughly. So my suspicion is that this, what this will probably do is it won't upset the, the general balance in the long run, it will just delay uh, the operations of probably Sichuan government to some degree, but then also CNPC and Sinopec for the next couple of years. So I would say that that probably means that they're very likely not going to meet the local, the 2015 target for shale gas. But it also means that I think the government government will now probably more aggressively move towards private actors uh, and other people who weren't potentially involved in the corruption. Uh, it has more reign to do that. It also might mean that they'll be more aggressive with CNPC and Sinopec, and perhaps this could have a really good effect. There's discussion of taking away from them some of the blocks. Uh, the CNPC and Sinopec have, uh, Sinopec are, have locked up 70% of the potential blocks uh, for shale gas for exploration. So if they open that up, that also could bring in more actors. So that's something they could do with, which doesn't upset uh, the inner workings of CNPC or Sinopec. So, so long story short, I would say that's something that could happen in the near future. Well, everybody's presentation was very, very interesting. And uh, uh, I guess, uh, can I ask you, uh, you know, because some of these swing supplies are so important, so um, I guess what Steve's saying is we need to gravitate more towards the low China shale case instead of the high China shale case. Um, and Isidro, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, I took from your presentation that you think the high Mexico shale case, export case, is even less likely, is still less likely even with the reforms. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, correct. and the way you also didn't sound too optimistic about major natural gas exports from Iraq, because you sort of implied that you thought the government was not having, had lost momentum on having a strategic gas vision. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> gas exports from Iraq is conditional on, on uh, further exploration. But with the current estimates and the current production projections um, over the next um, 15 to 20 years, and given the growing demand uh, to meet um, uh, the electricity and, and, and the industry, uh, it's very much unlikely to, to leave uh, a significant amount for, for export. So, so can 
two million dollar question. <laughs> uh, what does that mean for U.S. exports and uh, the North America market? Well, I mean, you're, you're basically painting a picture that seems very restrictive in terms of you know uh, uh, supply response from other parts of the world. So, in particular, these areas where we think there could be just incredible transitional opportunities. Um, <clears throat> that doesn't you know, allay the fact that there's actually risk associated with trying to move into that space because, you know, Isidro, as you pointed out, if things were to sort of right themselves very quickly in Mexico and the reforms are very conducive to attracting international capital, then it would be a very different story in a very short period of time because moving, you know, all that development infrastructure south from from uh, Railroad Commission District 4, which is just right across the border, is not a long haul. It could happen very quickly, provided the, the situation was right. So, you know, and that's why we do these scenarios, right? We want to try to sort of provide some sort of meaningful estimate of what the uh, uh, what the what the sort of cost associated with these sort of politically motivated constraints are. Um, now, with China, Steve, the, the story you're sort of laying out really does paint a low shale picture, and uh, you know. Due respect to the potential that Iraq could play in, in Europe uh, and that Mexico could play in the North American balance, um, China is, as you stated, the 800-pound gorilla. So, you know, we, we actually did run a low shale case, and what we see there is it does actually encourage a little bit more uh, LNG from the United States. But, again, the biggest responder uh, long term is Australia. So really what that what tells you is, yeah, it does sort of open the door for a little bit more U.S. influence in the global LNG market, but um, Australia, that would be good news to Australian developers, certainly. Um, in all regards, uh, you know, interestingly enough, what all these sort of, you know, potential negative, if you will, supply pictures really tell us is that uh, you're going to require, it's going to require a tremendous amount of pipeline, long distance pipeline and LNG trade. Um, and so, you know, getting back to what Tatiana and RJ were talking about, right, with Russia and their move to Asia and, and that being desirable in terms of long-term supply uh, uh, projections, um, you know, this is a story that's really supportive of that notion as well. So, you know, the idea that the global gas market's going to deepen if we sort of layer in these issues, I think, is enhanced. And ultimately, that will put pressure on traditional pricing paradigms. Now. I've said this before, I've written it in papers about this notion about market deepening and what it means for pricing terms. Moving away from oil indexation does not mean the price of gas is lower than an oil index price of gas. So it just means that the, the price of gas is determined by the supply at the margin. So that's one thing you have to remember. And in a case where the market deepens substantially and liquidity is no longer an issue, um, if demand is growing very quickly, then it's very likely that gas prices could be above what, a, what an oil parity price might suggest they would be. Interesting. Well, let me, uh, we only have a few minutes left because unfortunately uh, we have some panelists and participants that have planes to catch, so we need to stay on time, but I want to give the audience the opportunity uh, to ask a few questions to the panel. Uh, yeah. uh, Dr. Hatib, you mentioned how unexplored, underexplored uh, Iraq was. Um, Given that there's uh, reportedly 100 wells or so into the mid Mesozoic and only about 10 in the west in the Paleozoic, the potential for particularly unassociated gas in the Permian or Division and Silurian there and in the western Zagros of Iran and a little bit in Kuwait is substantial or it's not there. Um, to the modelers and scenario folks, how does this uh, modify if there turns out to be a whole bunch of T's? in that part of the Middle East? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll have to, great question. I'll, I'll preface it by saying that the, the resource assessments that are actually in the models are, are, are very robust. Um, so it's sort of like you know pushing on a string a little bit when you add a little bit to it. Um, uh, what really mattered ultimately is cost and what the constraints, the above ground, ground constraints are in terms of impediments to development. And so that's why we did the, you know, the, the, the Middle East stability case where we sort of pulled the cork on all Middle Eastern resources. And you see indeed there are a lot of different development pathways that can emerge. So I think that's really the, the, the more relevant question here because the resource assessments by any account are large. Um, so it really is what, what happens above ground. And let, let me add to that, because um, I did the case study on the Gulf Co Cooperation Council. You know, there's a, lot of there's a lot of resource imbalance in natural gas around the Gulf. 
um, that none of which you know is moving anywhere uh, because of all these you know geopolitical above ground inefficiencies. Um, and I would say my you know my geopolitical assessment is those inefficiencies are going to continue uh, for quite a long time, and I think Ambassador Region's remarks uh, really confirm that. Um, but if we really had a change on the ground, and you, you saw some of that geopolitics come into even the discussions over the future of Syria, um, because there was a news report that the uh, intelligence uh, chief of Saudi Arabia flew to Moscow uh, to assure uh, President Putin that Saudi Arabia would not use the Syrian venue as an export route for Sunni gas to go to Europe. Uh, and you know what's the Sunni gas? It's this corridor that would come from the GCC, from Saudi Arabia, up through Syria, and um, and uh, picking up the Ambari, the, the hopeful Ambari gas, and then you know supplying Europe through Syria. And indeed, in some of, in in the you know peace and love scenario uh, for the Middle East, uh, that is exactly what happens. Um, and so um, you know, but but the. Politics above the ground of you know could you ever really get there and uh, you know could you get to a scenario which uh, uh, Dr. Al Khatib has mentioned where Kuwait and Abu Dhabi are really short natural gas and maybe be very economical for them to buy it by pipeline from southern Iraq instead of uh, you know buying. LNG from distant places around the world. I mean, all of those scenarios require just a tremendous change in not only the leadership uh, attitudes in all the countries across the Gulf, um, but even just uh, d reforms in terms of domestic pricing patterns and uh, economic strategies. Isidro, I find it very troubling that the Mexican government has kept it a secret what they mean by the, st the productive state enterprise, what the legal parameters of that are. And I wonder specifically, and I wonder if you have thought about this, whether Pemex would become something other than a state agency governed by the NAFTA procurement rules, that is, after the reform and after you put in place this legal figure, would Pemex still be required to do the NAFTA procurement protocols? Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, first, um, remember that according to the new law, Pemex has two years uh, as a phase in to become a state productive company, which means that um, First, we must have the secondary legislation or the Pemex law. There will be a regulatory law for Pemex. And uh, at the end of April, we will have this new uh, law, a new bill. So it's going to be very important, that bill, because we're going to see whether Pemex will become a real uh, state or firm, independent from the Treasury which is uh, that very important, or, and it's going to be accountable. Th that's the key point. We will see that. If the government fails to do that, it will be very risky, because if PEMS continues to remain um, a rent collector, as I said, it, it won't compete with other firms. And Perhaps it will, uh, she will possess the fears that I uh, showed, but m most of them, they are already, some of them are mature fields, and some of them is conventional oil and gas. So the new areas, highly promising, will be exploited by private firms. So that will be uh, crucial, the uh, secondary legislation, and then the, this two year span in which uh, Payments will make the transition into becoming a kind of Lufthansa-like company, so, so, so to say. Your second question is very interesting about how uh, procurement, because um, payments will remain a state or company, how government procurement will be uh, regulated uh, after this law. Um, remember that NAFTA uh, regulates government procurement. It opens, opened open uh, government procurement above a, th 
a specific threshold, which I forgot it now, because, but we have to come back to NAFTA. It's very easy. It's just the quantity. And there's, um, and I'm quite sure, there's no exception for energy government procurement. Now, remember that chapter six uh, and um, negative list uh, says that um, is, um, a, a, the energy sector remains aloof NAFTA, a part of NAFTA, excuse me. But there's an exception on energy government procurement. There's a chapter of government procurement. So it means that proc uh, procurement made by energy firms are regulated by NAFTA. That's, to my meaning, the answer. Okay, last question, Andreas. Thanks very much. I promise it's a quick one that goes to Stephen. And please excuse my ignorance uh, of not understanding all the details of, of, uh, of, of Chinese shale. But I'm just wondering, we, we have all these news that, you know, um, uh, there is increasing protest against things that are decided above heads of, of local population. That goes back to, you know, infrastructure projects, environmental pollution, you know, a plant just being built right next to a village or these kind of things, including also, you know, protests against rampant corruption and all the things that you mentioned. So I'm just wondering whether that could actually become a factor in domestic shale gas production. I mean, I guess we're already down to a, a low shale case, but, but still, you know, there is these huge projections out there, as you mentioned, on, on where China shale would go. If, if the, um, you know, local protests actually emerge along the lines of, of of, of other subject, subjects or issues, then that co could actually become you know, a game changer, a, a really important issue. I'm just wondering whether that's, that's something you see uh, as important or not. Absolutely, protests can do affect this. Um, definitely on the, in terms of on the, on the supply side, in the sense that uh, if they're close to production areas, um, more and more I think that shale potentially competes with agriculture because of the water. Um, and, and so it's, it's very likely Sichuan is a good area for it to, to start off and continue. In many places in the south, you know, along the Yangtze River and those areas, uh, I think those would be more fast-tracked. But let's not, you know, rule out the possibility that, 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 that the central government or the oil and gas companies can come up with a new way of providing royalties, um, you know, to, to people to, because these are, in many cases, these are poor areas. You know, so Chongqing municipality, this very large city where they're exploring for shale gas, most of it is happening in kind of like the more mountainous areas where ethnic minorities live, and they don't have a lot of opportunities. So it's the same story as in the United States. Uh, if they can find some way to compensate these people, um, perhaps they can overcome that. Uh, but I think you're right. If they feel that they're just shut out and they're not getting anything out of this except the downside, they definitely would protest. And in recent years, they've been succeeding. Uh, in many places. Protests could also affect the side uh, on the demand side as well. Um, we, we've seen just people don't really want to put up with in the cities uh, all of this pollution. And so Beijing took the radical step of saying we're going to shut all four coal-fired power plants uh, by the end of this year. And so build four new gas plants. Here's seven billion dollars. Do it. Um, and, and Chinese governments have the ability to do that. And they're definitely trying to stave off protests in the cities. Uh, so the potential for protest really does affect, I think, the shale gas story in China. Okay, a last comment from uh, Dr. Al-Khatib. Yeah, uh, just um, uh, I wanted to clarify one thing about the um, challenging that facing the uh, uh, gas exploration. Uh, in addition to any um, political and, and geop well, geopolitical um, challenges, um, Iraq really need to adopt uh, some sort of uh, risk sharing or, or production sharing type of contracts with regards to uh, exploration acreages. The current terms offered in terms of like uh, uh, fee per barrel oil equivalents for uh, gas, especially when we're talking about like long-term investment and talking about the gas investment is entirely different from the oil investment uh, part. It's uh, quite discouraging to investors. And uh, without really adopting uh, some sort of like similar like the tax royalty or production sharing, basically risk sharing, to allow to invite uh, international oil companies uh, with the better incentives is going to be quite uh, difficult to really uh, get um, heavy investor investment uh, in the uh, exploration, uh, gas exploration. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to the panel. Let's give them a good round of applause. All right. Um, 
So just a couple of closing remarks. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for, for sticking it out. Um, I, I certainly think the material is, is very interesting. And uh, just if you want to sort of ever kind of look back and review what was said, all of this stuff is video archived and it's available on our website. So uh, that along with the presentations will be available for public consumption. So you'll be able to go back and set of, what did he say? You know, go back and look and check it out. So um, it's all there. And you might have noticed on the screens during the breaks and stuff, there were sort of a, a rolling kind of set of information that had Twitter feed accounts, um, uh, both for, for the Center for Energy Studies and for the Belfer Center, um, as well as uh, I think the email addresses, are not even, the web addresses are there as well. So the idea is you can go to those locations and find all of the case studies. Um, they've all been published with the exception of one, which was not discussed today, but hopefully it will be up there very shortly. Um, uh, it's a, an important one, it's on Iran. So um, we'll, we'll hopefully get that up soon. And we will certainly internalize a lot of the feedback we've gotten during the breaks and discussions uh, in so much as how we uh, uh, fine tune the modeling exercises so that we can actually get the scenarios written up and posted. And that'll be done in the next couple of months as well. Um, so there will be more to come and we will certainly be contacting everybody when everything is finalized and posted posted and um, um, so stay tuned uh, and thank you again for for being here and thank you to all the participants um, some of you traveled very long distances to be here and I I, I greatly appreciate that for that we'll go ahead and uh, adjourn the meeting